Hello, I'm Fred McNeil and you're watching QAC TV. And one of my favorite shows I get to film every week is called Papa's World. Each week we get local authors to come in. They talk about their books and we have a good time. Have we got a good one this week? Bloody Point, 1976 with Brent Lewis. Brent, hey, thanks a million for being here. Thanks right? for having me, Fred. Now, before we make this the Brent Lewis show, hey, look, I want the public to know. Uh, Papa's World uh, has been a big success, and it's all because you were kind enough to arrange about 10 authors to come in. And you know what? I think we've done a pretty good job promoting local authors, local books, and we want the community to know. For Summer Reed, hey, look at the books we've had here. This should be under everybody's own <laughs> Ocean City, all right? There you go. But publicly, I want to thank you for it. There's a lot of hard work organizing everybody. I appreciate that. Well, thank you, and I know that the authors who have participated in it really appreciate the opportunity to get their work out there, too. I and we had fun. We had one author I thought was 007. We had a couple wonderful women uh, who could tend to handle me psychologically and what books to read in the summer. Right. And it was a good, I'm just amazed. And then there's Nick Hoxter, yep. who could have sat here for 24 hours and told stories. He's right? a wonderful storyteller, no doubt about it. But we do appreciate it. It's great. All right, let's get to Brent. Tell everybody, if they don't know, who is Brent Lewis? Well, I was born and raised here on the shore. Local guy. Local guy. Both sides of my family go back generations. My uh, mom's side of the family, we can trace back to My Lord's Gift or Thumb Grant, Henry de Courcy. Dad's side of the family has probably been here just as long, but they were watermen and farmers. So they worked for a living. They worked for a living, and there were um, they weren't as conscientious about keeping records as the other side okay. of the family. Okay, so born and raised, Eastern Shore, good as gold here. Right? I guess so. Now, local schools? Absolutely. What? Graduated from Queen Anne's, 1980. 1980, okay. Mm -hmm. And you're living now on Kent Island? Actually, we... Five years ago, moved to Centerville. Oh, you're a Centervillian. Centerville, oh, you yeah. Right they have all this talent in Centerville. Well, right. like probably a good percentage of Centervillians are from the yeah. other end of the county. The, the uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, a lot have moved up here. Now, let me just ask you this. I always ask the author this. What got you? What was the bug? Right. I had one of the authors you sent was kind of to say that she was driving back from Montana, North Dakota. All of a sudden, she said, "I oh, read a book." <laughs> the idea. And she spent fifteen hundred miles not talking to her husband. <laughs> while she was writing the book. What was the bug that got you going? Well, you know, I think as a kid, uh, books and storytelling were always important. Books were a big part of growing up. My grandmother's house had books everywhere. Uh, when the Centerville Library opened, I remembered that, and uh, it used to be so exciting to go to the library sure. every Saturday. My mom often taught lessons through books. Okay. Uh, Aesop's Fables. She would, like if I would favorite. ask a question, oh, she yeah. would hand read this. Yeah, so you had to read about the fox and the grave. <laughs> Absolutely, and and uh, they were kind of life lessons, but almost as importantly as the books, I think. My dad was a waterman, mm -hmm. so as a kid, there wasn't much I loved more than sitting around and listening to him and his friends tell stories, okay. just talk about the old days. The lost or, art, but what a what a wonderful art, right? Absolutely, and they uh, that even as a kid. Uh, inspired me to tell stories. So okay. I always wrote as a kid. I wrote in high school a little bit. School what, newspaper, yearbook, or what? A uh, little bit with the newspaper stuff, journalism, more creative writing. Okay. Then you must have had Mr. Art Cobb. Who's Garson? Uh, 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 Mr. Garson. And uh, Mr. Garson might have actually been maybe a middle school teacher or uh, uh, at that point. Okay. And then um, K. D. Uh, K. Romanowski, Romanowski right. and you know all these people watch the show and they're smiling. <laughs> they made their day. Well, I certainly appreciate those teachers because they. Uh, I, I was a pretty good student until I got in high school, <laughs> and <laughs> then phew, everything went really downhill. So if it weren't for the support of those kind of teachers who knew that there was something there, even though I wasn't necessarily exhibiting it in my right. behavior, they knew there was some talent. They knew there was something there. So certain teachers did inspire that. Let me ask you, I uh, I started to read when uh, my mother at some point, uh, I was hopeless, I was like you in school, I, I was Sports Illustrated, Hot Rods magazine, right. and, I, and then she brought me a collected series of Ian Fleming's 07, oh. and I sent there one summer, I went through the whole series, right. this is in the mid-60s. Any particular author that turned you on? Well, when I was a kid, yeah. uh, uh, comic books were a big oh, deal. Okay, yeah. I 
I was four years old when that Adam West Batman yeah, came out, yeah. and it really just made such an impact. I don't know if it was the colors or the You're action. You're walking around the house saying, do you do wear a cape, a towel. Mom would have to tie a towel on me. <laughs> and uh, so comic books were, were a big part of, of growing up reading for me. Okay. And then as I got older... I kind of grew out of them, but now comic books have matured. They've come back. Thanks. And graphic novels and all that. So so that was a big influence. And, and certainly as a kid, I read whatever was available or whatever might have snagged my attention. Sure. But then as an adult, uh, I mentioned off-camera earlier, we talked about Elmore Leonard and Carl Heiss, and I like Tom Robbins. Okay. Uh, there are different authors who uh, speak to me different ways. All right. But you just read, you were a reader. Still a big I st reader? Absolutely still a big reader. Okay. I think I think to write, you probably need to read as much as you write. Hemingway once said, "Every book you write, you should read at least a hundred. Oh, more, that's right? a, I've uh, never heard that. I mean, but that's that, a good. Uh, Hemingway can say that. I can't say that. <laughs> So, Brent, let's, let's do a little bit of history. First book published was what? Uh, this book, Ken Island, uh, Stories from the Chesapeake, okay. was published in 2009. From 20, uh, 2000, 2001 until last year, I conducted the Ken Island Heritage Society's Oral History Program. Okay. So over a 10-year period, more or less, I had opportunity to sit down with scores of Ken Islanders primarily, but I also was able to expand a little bit if the person I was, if I could hang something on the person I was interviewing about Ken Island. Right. Because it was under the auspices of their Heritage Society, I felt like the mandate was to make sure. Tie it in with Tie it, it in somehow. It. So, like, for instance, Dr. Rhodes. Dr. Uh, Harry Rhodes. Dr. Just Harry just Rhodes yeah. just passed away recently. I could justify interviewing him because he was the um, head of the board of, uh, you know, the superintendent, superintendent of schools. He integrated schools in Queen Anne's County. Absolutely. He's a historic figure. Very in Queen important. Yeah. And yeah. so I was able to sneak those kind of folks in. And the publisher, which is the History Press, was expanding to the Mid-Atlantic region. And they were contacting heritage and historical societies all over the area looking for authors to pitch ideas. Miss Audrey Hawkins was the treasurer of the Ken Island Heritage okay. Society. She since passed away. She passed it on to me, and I think every day for two or three weeks she would call and say, did you send that in? Did you send that in? <laughs> so finally I just made a pitch. You got tired of the phone calls. I, yeah, yeah. Like I, got, I got to play gate Miss, Miss Audrey here. So I send in the pitch. History Press said, let's publish it, and then I thought, oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? Because I was completely unprepared this to do is it. stories. Stories that, that, that I've Chesapeake. been told. Okay. Now, right. Mainly based on the oral history interviews, though a lot of the research came from old newspapers, old uh, souvenir stuff that I was able to dig up, uh, the Heritage Society. The libraries are very helpful. I, I can't say enough good things about our librarians okay. in this county. Now, this is still available? It is still available through the History Press, Amazon. Okay, so we can just go type online, okay? Ken Island Stories from the Chesapeake by Brent Lewis. And yes, you get sir. get a hold of this. Yes, okay. sir. That's correct. So where'd you go from this one? So... About the time that came out, Jody Schultz, who is the right. president of the Volunteer right. Fire Department on Ken Island. Played a little football. He does a little bit of everything. Little bit, yes, sir. And a longtime friend of mine. We, okay. we grew up together. In fact, um, uh, his dad, Sonny, and my dad were watermen together okay. when they were young All men. Right. Okay. So Jody realized that they had one founding member left of the Ken Island Volunteer Fire Department. He knew I had done these oral history interviews and he asked me to interview Mr. Billy Lane, who was the last uh, founding member. And we interviewed Mr. Billy and we got such good stories. Jody and I looked at each other and said, we probably should interview as we many gotta people. We got to run with yeah, this one. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, I probably interviewed 30 to 40 different past members of the uh, fire department and the ladies' auxiliary. Just a local history Just of a local a, volunteer fire department. Absolutely, though I also tried to expand it to, you know, I think that volunteers have a certain core about sure. them. There's a there's a loyalty. There is. If you get out of bed on a cold January morning when that to, siren blows, you're on my side. Absolutely. You're a good guy. You're so good whether guy. you're on the woman. Ken Island Volunteer Fire Department or some volunteer fire department in Oklahoma, I think the type of people are the same. So even though it's very specific, I also tried to write it in a way that would uh, address those honorable qualities of all volunteers. I mean, it amazes me. In Centerville, when that siren goes off, I don't care if it's cold, rain, 3 o'clock in the morning, 
somehow men and women get in vehicles, yeah. get there, and save our lives. And the rest of us who roll over <laughs> while they're rolling out, we don't really get that sometimes. Yeah. And, and through the process of writing that book, um, you know, they, they tell a lot of poignant stories, they tell a lot of funny stories, but what really touched me was their dedication to our community. When was this, uh, remember, what was the date when this was founded, the Volunteer Fire Department? Uh, 47, 1947. I believe okay. that's right, right, though it's been a while since I've written that, so I may be that's a little right. off on and that And this particular group of men and women, they're really an institution, not only on Kent Island, but in this county. Absolutely. I mean, from the carnival or fair to the volunteer work. And a lot of times those people do other things that we never even no, hear about. No, no. So that, and again, available. Amazon. Uh, some of the local stores. One of the uh, biggest problems I think we face here with uh, local authors and writing is the lack of bookstores. Sure. I mean, that's something that's happening all across the country, but in our county in particular, we don't There's really nothing. have no any books. And no books. Nothing. Bowl. Man bookstore in Centerville. That used to be the highlight of Centerville. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have to find alternative ways to sell your books. I've joked over the last couple of years that with these two books, I sell really well in liquor stores. <laughs> <laughs> you throwing in a bottle of Big Scotch? I, I, don't, I don't know what that says about my book. coupon in the back of your brain? I, I, I don't know what it says about the book or okay. or anything, but I do sell a lot of books in liquor stores. Isn't that funny? Okay. <laughs> so this, but this is available in traditional ways, Amazon. Absolutely. Okay, and some local bookstores and a lot of liquor and stores. And a lot of liquor We're stores. We're going to have to check that store. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. Now, hey, look, you got me. I, I haven't read this book, but you got me in the cover. Okay. Now, all of a sudden... Uh, we've changed direction as a writer a little bit? Or a not? little bit. Yeah. Uh, for many years, uh, fiction has been in the back of my mind as something I wanted to at least give a shot. Okay. And I often think that sometimes you can tell truths through fiction. Sure. That is much harder to tell through nonfiction. A lot of people say it's easier, right? It, it can be. It yeah. can be because... I don't write anything really to beat anyone over the head with lessons or try to teach anything, but I think everything has a theme and something, there has to be some heart in it somewhere. And I find a lot of heart in the people that I have known and met here on the Eastern Shore. Well, let's get, before we delve into the guts of the book, we're not going to give it all away. Okay. Right? We're going to talk about when it's coming. Look at yeah, it had me sold in the cover. This is a combination, and this is like an uh, Ian Fleming 007 cover. I mean, you have a Bloody Point, which, you know, oh, okay. Now, explain. Let's go to the title, and then we'll go to the cover. Bloody Point 1976. Bloody Point 1976. I wanted to kind of nail a place in time. Okay. And there's some debate over what a historical novel really is. Some people say that... If it's not, if it's less than fifty years, it doesn't really qualify as a historical novel. I mean, more recent than fifty. Years. More recent than fifty okay. years, and I feel like uh, some of the other standards are that if it nails a specific time and place that's in the past, that qualifies that as historical. historical. Okay. And so, even though genre-wise, this may be considered a crime thriller. I think of it in some ways as historical fiction. Well, help me out. Okay, Bloody Point, those who aren't from Ken Island or the Eastern Shore, this is a specific, one of the deepest point, if not the deepest point in my It is, okay. absolutely. The deepest point on the Chesapeake Bay, I think 175 right, feet off okay. Bloody Point, right. something like that. So that's a real place that's that Ken Islanders place. know about. The 1976, I mean, great year, the Olympics that year, presidential election, uh, what, 200th uh, birthday of our country. Why 76? That plays a lot into to it actually okay. the story takes, no, don't give away anything no right? I won't okay. uh, but the story does play, take place over the bicentennial 4th of July oh, okay. weekend okay. it all takes place over a weekend from Friday to Sunday the 4th of July was on that Sunday so the 70s were very much a changing time. We, I think Americans had kind of become disillusioned, and it was the me generation, and also because that's the era that I grew up in. Okay. And well, I thought, we just escaped the 60s where all hell was breaking loose. All kinds of turmoil. The, I, and I agree with you. I think the early 70s were really 60s extended. Absolutely. Then we went through the whole Nixon mess. The Watergate. Ford tried to calm down. Vietnam had ended. Oh, that's right. We've got to forget. We're forgetting. That's right. Vietnam ended what in seventy four, seventy five. So that that hangover is there. Carter was elected. Right. So mm -hmm. we got a peanut farmer putting a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> 
country is 200 years old. So Absolutely. I'm sorry. So that was. So yeah, that was that that was really just the inspiration for it. Was okay. uh, I wanted to tell a story that kind of reflected the time I grew up here okay. on the and change. Uh, change How is old were you in '76? Well, um, I was only 14. Oh, you're a kid. Okay. My character's 20. My major character's oh, okay. 20, so he's a little older than I am. Right. But yeah, I was born in 1962. Okay. Well, let me. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna do full loop. We're gonna come back to the guts of the book in a second. The cover. Maybe, <laughs> tell me. I don't know. Maybe I'm a male chauvinist. Uh -huh. pig, and everyone's gonna get mad at me. Uh, great cover. Combination Eastern Shore and 007. Tell, who did the cover and tell me about that? My friend and uh, Laura Ambler. She's a local writer and a graphic artist. Okay. Uh, she's very involved with everything from the Beta Ocean Conference. Laura and I are in a group uh, forum, like a critique group together. Mm -hmm. And I knew she was a graphic artist, but I also knew she has a lot of plate spinning. I contacted her early on and said, you know, I just feel like I would not be performing due diligence if I didn't ask you if you would give help it, me with my cover. cover. Okay. And she was so enthusiastic. Okay. Within a couple days, I had a dozen different options. Mm. And all the other writers I know said, that's amazing. When we talk to graphic artists, they give us they one or two choices. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. don't have a lot of input. But Laura, um, her enthusiasm shows, oh, in, shows the in the cover. Great cover. I mean, I don't know about you, if I was at a bookstore and I'm looking for something to sit down on the beach with or spend the week with, I mean, that, that you, you got me. I mean, I, Thank you. I, I said to you earlier, I didn't know that was 07 on the cover. <laughs> great, great, great Thank cover. you. That That is uh, one of the goals of a cover, is to grab your attention and Tell, okay. So tell us, give me a little bit of the guts of the book without giving it away. I can uh, give you the what we call the elevator pitch. Let's get the pitch. It's when you're standing in the uh, elevator with the famous director and you've got one moment to tell him what your story is about. This play, again, takes place over the bicentennial weekend, 1976. It's about a young local waterman, kind of naive. His name is Tui Walter. And he's hired by a local big wheel to go to Baltimore. Take, and the, take the boat and go to Baltimore. And no, no, drive. Just drive to, drive to Baltimore and bring home the rich man's daughter from the block. Uh oh. It's a rescue mission. It's a rescue mission. It's a quest. The story, uh, the block is historically important in a lot of ways. I don't know how many people know about An the block. Interesting spot. It's notorious. Blaze Bar, and let's face it, it was where adults went for adult entertainment. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. in the 30s and 40s, it was high class. Yes. Um, Laurel and Hardy, Jackie Gleason, Gypsy Rose Lee, all these famous celebrities performed on the block. Oh, burlesque. 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 the finest. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of the best restaurants in Baltimore were on the block. And then crime and pornography and drugs and all those things invaded and it and, changed. Yeah, and the Blaze Star kind of good, wholesome fun left and it became the dark side. Absolutely. And and then the, the, the area shrunk over the decades and, and got worse. And so Tui, my character, is and Tui's just a good old boy. He's boy. just a good young guy who wants to do the right thing, and he's thrown into this world of vice and violence okay. that is really out of his. He's a he's fish out of water, okay. and he's trying to find this girl who he had gone to school with. Okay. Um, a little romantic. Uh, there is a romantic okay. interest, but not with that that, okay. that girl. There's another character that there's okay. some romance. So with. Eastern Shore Waterman drives to Baltimore. He's got to deal with the interesting block situation. <laughs> And try to find this young girl. Try woman. to find this young girl and bring okay. her home to her dad. Okay, so a nail biter? I hope so. Okay, good. All right, okay. Uh, I always ask you, audience, you, you made some comments before. Is this mm -hmm. uh, adult? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. I would say that if it were a film, it would probably be R rated. Okay. The readers, I think when you write a fiction book, you kind of have to have what Stephen King calls like the perfect reader in your head and you write for that person though you know that your audience is bigger than that 
And when I first started, I thought that my audience was probably men between 40 and 60 with an interest in Chesapeake Bay region who like to read crime novels and uh, was also interested in pop culture. There's a, there's a lot of pop culture references. And to the pop culture of the 70s. Of that, of that era. Uh, my critique group are mainly women, though. And when we started reading, I was really surprised how overwhelmingly enthusiastic the women were about it's a nice romantic book. story. I mean, <laughs> Bubba goes to Baltimore, goes to right, Baltimore right. with good intentions and faces the he's, sins of big cities. Absolutely. It's a scary place. Okay. And he's uh, not a scary guy. Right. So, and, and it's really, I guess, if anybody were to ask what it is about, it's about change. Uh, it's about people changing. It's about places changing. It's about a time that was changing. Now, the location is all Baltimore or a combination of Baltimore? A combination that starts on the shore. Okay. Uh, the whole middle section takes place in Baltimore, and then they come home. And the last okay. part is the uh, repercussions of the weekend and really the history of these people. Uh, it's challenging because change sometimes is a little traumatic. Okay, certainly. And this cut in the country. I mean, come on, we basically went, like you said, Vietnam War just ended. Absolutely. Uh, the, from 65 to probably 75, this country had more changes, I think, than any other time in its history. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, Baltimore, like you said, the block was changing, uh, Maury's and... Uh, At, well, the Supreme Court had recently determined that um, the standard for let's say pornography or that yes. kind of thing was the community what was the community standard right. so the block had no standards no. No. so everything went really downhill and I think that if it's a, a adult in a tone it's because I couldn't figure out a way to write about that era and that place without writing it in an adult way you can't have characters Go to the block and go drink a cream soda no. somewhere. You're going to have hard whiskey. It's, it's going to be double tough. the price of anywhere else, and the beer is going to be warm. And you're not going to complain. You're not going to complain. There's a big guy in a corner <laughs> looking at you. Now, Haley, I always like to ask authors. The Waterman part probably came pretty easy to you. I mean, because your fa family mm -hmm. history on the shore. How, how did you research uh, Baltimore mid '70s uh, newspapers? Uh, that's I mean, a really interesting question. I mean, Blaze, I mean, I, it's funny. As a kid, and this is, I hope mom's not watching this show, <laughs> a big deal was us to drive from Washington. We'd go see a Baltimore Bullets basketball game. Sure. And then we'd always try to sneak in these places in the block. Right. And we immediately stopped with by some <laughs> six-foot-five guy at the door. Because I'd show him my library card at 18. He'd say, hey, kid. Get out on the street and get a Coke and leave it. <laughs> I mean, how did you get the, the, the flavor of it? Well, uh, I must admit that by the time I came along, well, again, I graduated from high school in 1980, so by 78, 79, the drinking age was 18. Uh, it all changed. It all changed, so you could be in high school and be legal, and there were road trips, Yes, I've, I've got to say. It was a rite of passage. It I'm was sorry. a rite of passage. For pa Washington and D.C. and Eastern Shore boys and males, I'm sorry, it was. Very realistic. Yes. And so some of that was experiences that I kind of remembered from then, okay. but I did do a lot of research. And I have characters that, uh, one of my characters is a, uh, a drug adult kind of falling from grace mm -hmm. block doc, a doctor. Okay. And so... I had to really research and, and figure out, what's he on? Why is he like this? Yeah. And I, it, it's completely... Because the drug scene was different, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And strange to my experience, uh, he's a, a venous drug user, user and I, I just had to figure out what's, what's making him like this. Yeah. Yeah. So recently, someone who had read the book said, how do you know so much about that? And yeah. kind of... It's research. You, sure. you uh, most people. So you a lot of research. A lot of research, yeah. and and I think you know there's something to be said for. There's that old saying that writers should write about what they know. Mm -hmm. There is some truth to that, but I also tell other writers that we all know about love, 
We all know about heartbreak. We all know about anger and pain. So when you write about what you know, to me, that's what that means. Write about things emotionally that you know. You can hang your story on anything and research. Let's face it, J.K. Rowling probably never went to... Uh, <laughs> she wasn't writing she brooms. Wasn't, she wasn't <laughs> writing brooms and going to sorcery school. So you, if you just wrote about what you knew all the time in, a, in the real strict sense of that, books would be very, very boring. Very boring yeah. So research, there was a lot of research. In fact, writing, before I started the novel, I spent about six months reading how to write a novel okay. uh, before I ever wrote a word. Let me ask you, where, the idea, where did it come from? I mean, it's kind of a charming little East, I mean, Eastern Shore of Bubba. Good right. old boy. Good old boy. Uh, again, not having read the book, sounds like a good guy. A very good guy. And a rich guy said, hey, help me get my daughter. Where did the idea come from? Just sitting on his front porch one day? Or? I think that all these things that you write with fiction that have a lot of different layers, it probably stews for a long, long time. I think the idea was plant being probably planted or something, stews. You read or something. Yeah, and you and you pull this from over here, and yeah. you think, wow, this might this character oh, it sounds great. Huh? Uh, character development, I think, is very important. You you really have to know who your people are. Uh, I think people sometimes make a mistake with writers. They think. Oh, is that you? And I can only answer, it's not me, but I know them. Okay. That's I know nice. these people. Uh, Brent, uh, we're about uh, running out of time here, but this book is not out yet? Or it's it available on oh, Amazon sorry. as of okay. uh, today. And you told me that you have people who have more copies than you have. Right? I, my copies are coming next week, and <laughs> my understanding is if you order on Amazon, you can have it as early as Saturday. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so Mother's Day is out. There's Mother's hope. Day is out. Okay. Well, Brent, I'm going to tell you what, between the cover and not having read a word, I'm going to go to Amazon and get this. It sounds great. Okay? Thank you very much. So, look, I'd like to, again, as we before we wrap up the show, thank you again for making Papa's World a big success. It was a probably the best show I did all year. Awesome. Right? Really, and please thank the authors. All right? Again, my uh, friends who have participated uh, in these interviews, it has meant a lot to them. It's hard to get the exposure that we would like to get so every bit helps and Brent good luck with this folks I'm gonna tell you right now if you need a summer read us guys are going to Ocean <laughs> City I would think I'd get on uh, Amazon or wherever uh, Bloody Point 1976 by Brent Lewis it's a must buy and Brent thank you again thanks right? for having me I really appreciate good. it this is Fred McNeil you've been watching Papa's World on QAC TV my time's up we're gonna see you next time